Hi, everyone, and welcome to WCN's Closer Look. And very fittingly, happy early Well Pangolin Day, which is happening tomorrow, February 17th. My name is Zoe. I'm a Senior Programs Manager here at WCN, and I'm excited to have you all join us this lovely Friday morning for me, afternoon for some, and evening, depending on where you are. Um, quick announcements. Please remember to use the chat and Q&A feature to send in your questions during all of these lovely presentations. We will get to those at the end. We will also be posting the recording on YouTube by early next week. We have a very full lineup for you today. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you all Aza Schumann, who's our director of PCF. And she's joined by some amazing representatives from the Pangolin Project, as well as Langland Conservation, who will share about their work protecting Kenya's last giant pangolins. So over to you, Aza. Well, hi everyone, I'm Azza, Director of the Pangolin Crisis Fund. Um, and I'm so thrilled to be with you all here on the eve of World Pangolin Day. So I'm gonna give you an update on our strategy and then you're gonna hear from two of our amazing partner organizations. The PCF gave our largest grant of 2023 to the Pangolin Project. And you're gonna hear from this critical group working in East Africa and the lengths that they are going to to save giant pangolins in Kenya. And then you're going to hear from Langland Conservation, who are providing critical AI support from behind the scenes. The PCF is about protecting pangolins, but we are so much more than a funder. We want to work with our partners and we want to help them solve the problems they're facing so that they don't have to face them alone. And we want to give you an insight into how we do that. Now, I'm guessing that you are all here because you know something about pangolins, but there are a few things that you might not know about the species themselves. Next slide, please. So there are eight known species of pangolins living across Africa and Asia. So the Pangolin Crisis Fund really is a global fund. Four of them live in Africa, and those are these guys that you can see. This includes the two smallest of all pangolin species. These are tree pangolins. Uh, the little guys at the top, on the top left, that's the white-bellied pangolin, and then the black-bellied pangolin on the top right. And they live up in the canopies of the rainforest in Central and West Africa. And these are really small. They can be two or three pounds. We also have the Temix uh, pangolin, who's a ground pangolin um, from Southern and Eastern Africa. That's the guy with his tongue out. And we've also got the largest pangolin species of all. And I would say the most elusive pangolin species of all, which is the guy in the bottom right. That's the giant pangolin. You're gonna hear more about this amazing animal from Claire and Jeremiah. Next slide, please. There were also four Asian species of pangolin, and we really put a spotlight on them last year because three of them are critically endangered. There's the Sunda pangolin, that's the little guy who's, uh, who's climbing up the tree. Um, the Palawan pangolin, who is uh, the one on the top right, is having a nap. Um, Palawan pangolins are only found in one province in the Philippines. So they have the most restricted range of all pangolin species. You've got the Chinese pangolin, who's the little guy peeping out from the safety of mom on the bottom left. Um, and we also have that beauty, the, the Indian pangolin on the bottom right, who's walking along the, on, on the ground. Next slide, please. But the bad news is that all eight species are in big trouble. So they're killed by poachers for their meat, which is often eaten as a delicacy, sold to high-end restaurants. And there's a demand from wealthy visitors and expats, um, particularly some expats from, from Asia. Um, and, and so the demand for meat is one of the problems that, that pangolins face. Next slide, please. But the really big problem that pangolins are facing is this. They're hunted for their scales. Their scales are made of keratin, like our fingernails, um, but they're ground down and they're used in traditional medicines. It could be traditional local medicines in the in the ranges where they live, um, but the real driver is, is the um, traditional Asian medicine markets, and particularly the traditional Chinese medicine markets. Now, these scales don't have any proven benefit um, medicinally, but the users believe that they do. And so tragically, this is the primary driver of poaching. Next slide, please. 
And this is a big problem for pangolins because they're being hunted in Africa and Asia in their hundreds of thousands. And they're smuggled um, for their meat, but particularly for the medicine market. And so that's why pangolins are the number one most trafficked mammal in the world. And all eight species are at risk of extinction. Now, I know this is a tough video. This shows a seizure of live pangolins. So actually what you're looking at are the lucky ones, but I know it's still a tough video and it reminds me why we do what we're doing. Next slide, please. So this is why WCN created the Pangolin Crisis Fund. We were launched in 2019 and we've just started our fifth year. And this shows what we've accomplished so far. We're growing in size, which is important because there was so much attention on pangolins during COVID as the possible vector for the spread of the disease. But now there's so many other things going on in the world. Have people forgotten pangolins? Well, no, they haven't because 2023 was our biggest ever fundraising year. We started the fund laying foundations and now in 2024, we're able to grow and respond to new needs. And so we have this constant feedback loop. So we're constantly improving and having even greater impact. The really key part is the momentum is continuing to build. And we realize that we can only do this by having a larger and mo more coordinated effort. Next slide, please. So these are our strategic pillars in the Pangolin Crisis Fund. They're all connected and they all involve multiple partners working in a coordinated effort. And so my role is to join the dots. I, I take an aerial view and um, work with all of our partners so that their skills become a collective for the group as a whole. Today, we're gonna to talk about the first part of our strategy. So to protect pangolins and their habitats. It's complicated and there are big challenges. So we have to have big solutions. And you're gonna hear from Claire about her team's work in Kenya. But before we move on to, to uh, handing over to Claire, I wanted to set the scene and show you a different project because there are common problems and common challenges and common solutions. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the Katala Foundation, which is the group that the Pangolin Crisis Fund is supporting in the Philippines. Now their work involves monitoring of wild pangolin populations, like you can see in this slide. But importantly, they work hand in hand with local people to reduce poaching and habitat loss. Next slide, please. The Katala Foundation teach people about the local environment and pangolins become a symbol of hope about why it's so important to live in harmony with nature. Next slide, please. And you know what? It's really working because now rather than selling pangolins to wildlife traffickers, local people, if they find them, they hand them to the Katala Foundation. And this video shows, uh, it's actually a video that I took when I was uh, last visiting the Katala Foundation in the Philippines. And it shows a young pangolin who's been released back into the wild. And the area that he's been released into this safe area is supported by the Pangolin Crisis Fund. Next slide, please. If we want to work with, to, to protect wildlife, we have to work with local people. It's absolutely key. If we want to conserve land for biodiversity, we can only do this by making that land profitable for local people. Local people living alongside the land, within it, local people who own the land, they need to benefit from conserving it. It's, this is fundamental to success of conservation. So you're gonna hear about some of the complexity and challenges, as well as some really inspiring solutions from the Pangolin Project team in a landscape where habitat loss and land fragmentation is a much bigger threat than poaching. Because it doesn't have to be one thing or the other, the land can be owned by local people and conserved, but conservation needs to be profitable because uh, there are other things that, that local landowners would wanna do with their land. So we have to make it um, a, a, attractive for them to conserve the land and the animals that live there. And that's why the work that the Pangolin Project team matters so much. It matters so much for the giant pangolins that they're saving in Kenya, but it's so much bigger than that because the team are trialing new initiatives and they, they are cracking problems. And we're gonna use these solutions to, to, to solve these problems globally. Next slide, please. Pangolins are facing some major threats, but the Pangolin Crisis Fund is funding some big solutions. We know that as a collective, we have the power to save all eight species of pangolins, as well as the other animals that, say, that share their same habitats and that are traded by the same criminal networks. We just have to be really smart and we have to work as a team. Next slide, please. 
So we're funding big picture thinking, working in partnership with traditional Chinese medicine leaders who are themselves passionate about removing not only pangolin scales, but all endangered species from traditional Chinese medicine. If we wanna be successful, we need to be ambitious. Next slide, please. And we have a global network of partners and our network continues to grow. We're playing an active role, connecting people to one another to share collective skills. And we play a really important convening role because we are a neutral partner and people trust us. And it means that we are able to broker relationships between lots of different groups. Next slide, please. And this includes providing access to groundbreaking technical data analytics to support illegal wildlife trade investigations, landscape level support, and so much more through our partners, Langland Conservation, who are also on this uh, webinar. Next slide, please. So this way, the Pangolin Crisis Fund is helping to ensure that the people who are on the ground doing the conservation work have access to the support they need. So they don't have to think about it. They can focus on the job right in front of them because whether they need data or analytical support to monitor pangolins and their habitats, like you can see here. Next slide, please. Or maybe they can benefit from hearing about best practice techniques for rehabil rehabilitating rescued pangolins so that even little babies like this one have a fighting chance and one day they can be released safely back into the wild. Next slide, please. So we're funding big solutions tailored to the needs of the groups that we're working with. And this leads me on to our biggest grant of 2023 and the incredible work of the Pangolin Project team in Kenya. I visited this group in 2023. I was so impressed with how much they were doing. They had so little resources, but the team was passionate and they were really, really going above and beyond. They were amazing people. They had, had such a good plan. So we really got behind them. And it's such a privilege now to hand over to Clara Kell, who's the founder of the Pangolin Project, and to hear about the inspiring work that she and her team are doing. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to hand over to Claire. Hi, everyone. Um, wow, what an honor to be here this evening um, uh, with you all. Um, I can see there's now 73 uh, participants and, and it's so great to have uh, all these ears listening about Pangolin, particularly on the eve of World Pangolin Day. Um, yeah, and it's great to be here and thank you so much for WCN for hosting this meeting and for that introduction for Maza. What a wonderful introduction to Pangolins as a whole and introduction to this program. We're super excited to be here with you. Um, so as Aza said, um, I founded the Pangolin Project in 2020. So we're a relatively young organization and we've come a long way in that short period of time. And I'm here to tell you about our current work and our current operational activities. Um, and yeah, and what we're doing and what we're up to and what a massive difference funding from Pangolin Crisis Fund is making to us. Um, okay, next slide, please. So I always think it's great for people to see our team. So we're currently a team of 13 um, individuals uh, based in Kenya. We do have a, a charitable organization that's an umbrella arm in the UK, but we're a fully operational base and, and Kenya's our home and, and our heartland and where our operations are set up. Um, so that's me on the right, but I'm here speaking on behalf of the entire team. And essentially, I work for that team. I basically, my sole job is to ensure that they can do their work to the best of um, everything that they need and to ensure that they have everything available to them for them to be able to get their job done. Uh, next slide, please. So we are, have two bases in Kenya. One is in, um, in the north of Kenya in an area called Nanyuki, but our main operational base uh, is down in the south of Kenya. So many of you will be familiar with the Maasai Mara and Mara Serengeti ecosystem down on the Tanzanian border. And we work on the far west side of that ecosystem in, a, in an area, a small area called Nyukweri. Um, and Nyukweri is on the far west of the Mara Plains, but it is part of the Greater Mara ecosystem. Next slide, please. Um, so the Pangolin Project's mission has always been to ensure the protection of all pangolin species and their habitats on which they depend. There are spe three species of pangolins within Kenya. 
Temminck's ground pangolin, as I spoke about before, is the most widespread of all of the pangolin species. Um, but there's also the white-bellied tree pangolin that is found in a small forest enclave in the far west of Kenya. And actually, up until about 2020, um, we didn't think that the giant ground pangolin um, continued to exist in Kenya. Um, the previous sightings of it were recorded in 1971. Um, but in 1920, um, 2020, sorry, not 1920, in 2020, it came to our attention that giant ground pangolin were uh, in an area that had been previously unrecorded. Next slide, please. So the Nyukwari ecosystem is this area on the far um, west side of the Mara. And essentially, as you come off the savannas and the plains of the Mara, you climb up a huge escarpment that's about 2,000 feet down by the Tanzanian border, and you come into a forest ecosystem. Um, and it is a phenomenal area, and we refer to it as the coral reef, if you like, of the ocean, if the savanna was the ocean. Um, so it is part of the Great Mara ecosystem, and it has this huge number of um, species that you don't find anywhere else in the Great Mara ecosystem. So often when people think of the Mara, they think of massive plains games. So elephants, lions, rhinos, and all those things are hugely, hugely important. But Nyukwari is part of the forest, a uh, part of the greater Mara ecosystem. And as a forest ecosystem, it offers a huge amount of biodiversity that is not found anywhere else. Next slide, please. Um, so this area um, is really unique. It is a convergence of uh, Equatorial Guinea rainforest, but also Afro-Montane forest from, from the north. And it would have previously had a small uh, fringe of the Mao ecosystem um, coming down to it. So it's actually a close, it was previously a closed canopy forest system um, that was interspersed with glades and, and savanna as well. Um, and it's a really phenomenal area with lots of unique species, including this big buttress tree that, uh, that is shown in the vineyard in the video here. Next slide, please. Um, and this is an area where giant ground pangolin are found. Now, as Azza said, giant ground pangolin are, the, are really kind of considered as the rarest and most elusive of the African pangolin species. Um, they get to about two meters in length and can weigh up to 45 kilos in weight. So they are pretty enormous. You really wouldn't miss them um, if they walked in front of you. But they are a forest dwelling species um, and they are limited really to, to rainforest and equatorial um, forest belt systems. Um, because in these forest systems, it enables there to be enough food for them to consume. So forests which are high rainfall in nature, they often have ecosystem service providers such as elephants that knock down trees. And these trees and plants and fauna and the high rainfall enable there to be a high enough amount of diversity of ant and termite species on which these pangolins depend. So as I said before, the last recorded sighting of a giant ground pangolin was in 1971, until it came to our attention um, in, in 2020, 2021, that actually giant ground pangolin had been seen in an area on the west side of the Mara. And that really sparked our interest. And what we came to realize is that this is an isolated population of giant ground pangolin um, and that they live in this ecosystem on the edge of the Mara. Next slide, slide please. The giant ground pangolin are but one species within this area. We've recorded up to 37 mammal species in the area. Some of them are unique only to there, um, but it's also a space for other species that are better known. So actually this area was known as a maternity ward for the, for the elephants from the Mara savannas that would come up and carve in the forest system and then go back to the savannas with their calves. So this is a, a really beautiful little elephant calf that we recorded on chat camera trap at the end of last year. Um, and we have had several births in the forest in the last three months as well. Next slide, please. So the challenge that we face in this area is that sadly, this is an isolated population of giant ground pangolin and they are in real trouble. Um, we're down to about 30 to 80 individuals remaining in the area and we estimate we've probably lost 80% of the population. Um, and I'm gonna to highlight to you uh, currently what the, the current problems are. So next slide, please. 
So one of the biggest problems that these giant pangolin are facing is that within this area, although it is a forest ecosystem, it was never gazetted and placed under formal protection by the Kenyan government. Um, and as a result of that, in recent years, the area has actually been subdivided and allocated to individual landowners. And these landowners um, depend on agriculture and livestock for their livelihoods. Um, and then sadly, you can't derive a livelihood from those, uh, those two things under closed canopy forest. So the first thing people do when they are allocated their plot of land is to put a fence up around it. And the fencing is the number one risk to these giant ground pangolins in this area. Um, sadly, um, we estimate that up to three individuals are lost every single month until recent months on the electric fences. Pangolin are particularly prone to electric fencing across the African continent, both the Temix ground pangolin and the giant ground pangolin. Um, and sadly, this is really just a result of their defense mechanism, which is to curl up in a ball when they th when they face threat. Um, and sadly, when they get electrocuted, that is their first tactic, is to stop and curl into a ball. And secondly, as unfortunately that the wire gets trapped underneath their scales above them, and it makes it impossible for them to get off the wire once they are on it. Um, so the electric fencing is a huge, huge problem for us and is really going to be the reason why we will lose this population in the next three years unless we act relatively rapidly. Um, next slide, please. So the second problem that we have within this area and the second greatest threat is habitat loss. Um, so this is a forest ecosystem. This is a high rainfall area. Um, and much like everywhere else in the world where we put those two conditions together is that the land is incredibly fertile beneath it. Um, and people that are allocated forests have to earn a livelihood off the land that they have. And so therefore they are clearing the land so that it can make way for livestock through grazing or for leasing for agriculture, for agriculturists to come in to grow um, plots, um, to grow <laughs> crops and plants, sorry. Um, and so this is a massive problem in terms of habitat loss. Now, Nyukwari is very much representative of other places in the world, and the giant pangolin is actually symbolic of the biodiversity that we are all standing to lose um, as a result of these processes. Next slide, please. And the third place is that they, that is faced is the poaching. And poaching can take on many forms. It can be poaching for traditional use or to make its way into the large um, globally legal wildlife trade that Azra has spoken about just before. Next slide, please. So uh, in 2020, 2021, it came to our attention about the presence of the giant, giant ground pangolin within this area. And the, uh, the uh, the Pangolin Project pivoted. Um, we realized the threats to this population. We recognized that they were an isolated population, that their numbers were being decimated as a result of the risks that I've just talked about. And then unless we did something immediately, that we would lose this population by 2028. And so we made a decision to pivot and move our entire team to this area to set up our base there and to work solely on the protection of giant ground pangolin and the habitat on which they depend, which ultimately means working on saving and conserving the last of the Nukwari ecosystem. And this has really only been possible with the help of Pangolin Crisis Fund and other donors that is enabling us now to do, to do this. Next slide, please. So what is it that we are actually doing? So our team that you met just before in that photo and Jeremiah, who's on this call and a couple of others of our team um, are dedicated firstly to the monitoring of pangolins. So um, they monitor giant ground pangolins through three different ways. One is through reports from the community. So we work extensively with landowners and community members within this area. And we've moved from raising awareness to then looking at engagement in the conservation of this species. And we've had huge success in doing this. So the community now report when they see giant ground pangolin. And we have what's known as a rapid response team that responds at any time of night to go out to giant ground pangolin, where we measure them and then we attach trackers to the individuals to better understand their habitat use. So this here is a photo of our team that is uh, working on a giant ground pangolin that you can see um, to attach a tracker to them. Next uh, picture, uh, next slide please. Um, so it's really vital because we know so little about giant ground pangolin to understand a little bit more about them. So even very basic information about weight, about length, about length of their claws and about their physiology is adding to that huge amount of knowledge within the wider conservation sector about giant ground pangolin. Next slide, please. 
So as well as monitoring pangolin and looking at their habitat use and where they're moving and the threats that they face um, and how that's directly impacting on individuals, we're now looking at risk mitigation as well. So we're really moving to a right way from just monitoring and really now to tackling these problems and ensuring the conservation and protection of the giant ground pangolin in the years to come. So the first thing is that, and this is a real fire brigade measure, is that we're removing electricity from the wire fences within this area to really save and to mitigate and to reduce the, mortal the mortality of giant ground pangolins in this, in this area. So we remove electricity from wire fencing um, that is under 65 centimetres in height. Next slide, please. Um, so to date, uh, we started this program in November last year, thanks to the Pangolin Crisis Fund, and we've had a 30% uh, thirty percent success with landowners. So landowners have to agree to allow us to do this. And as a result, to date, 73 to 75 kilometers um, of, of wire, the electricity has been removed from it. Um, and this is a really big step. This is a big step from engaging with community and, and, and creating awareness and standardizing knowledge about the pangolins, but then leading to behavior change um, within landowners within the area and people that live alongside pangolin. Those ones that don't always opt and say yes to, uh, to taking out the electricity, their number one reason is that they want to utilize the land for agriculture. And the number one threat to that agriculture, as they see it, um, is porcupines. So they want to keep porcupines out. Porcupines are a little bit like a badger in the UK system. They love eating crops. Um, and so they want to keep the porcupines out as well as keeping out other goats, um, other wildlife species, and also a hyena for small stock if they're livestock keepers. Next slide, please. Um, so it's not particularly glamorous work, just to highlight that. Sometimes we can all think about tagging animals and it's super, super glamorous. Um, and really this is the day-to-day -day of, our, of our team's job is that we work with um, electrical fence technicians to do things like this. And this gentleman goes around all of these landowners, removing the electricity and then retesting the wire fences to check that the bottom strands are safe for pangolin to pass through and ensure their safe movement as they move through this cha ever-changing landscape. Next slide, please. So the other part that we're now working on, and this is a relatively new program with us, is actively working on habitat protection. Um, and that means ensuring the conservation of this area and ultimately restoring it to uh, a forest system. So in the last five years, this area in yellow, and this is about 5,000 hectares, 80% um, of the forest has been lost within this area. Um, that's 5,000 hectares there. Uh, you can see these fragments of forest that remain. It's a total of about 1,000 hectares that is remaining um, as forest in these tiny, tiny pockets of uh, um, uh, that you can see here. Previously, everything in the middle of that yellow block and to the left would have all been dark green. It was, was a closed canopy system until 2017. So a huge amount has been lost. But we don't do this on our own. Within this area, there is this, and within Kenya, there is a phenomenal concept of community conservancies. So this is where groups of landowners come together and they form a group uh, conservancy whereby they are then uh, able to conserve the land um, uh, as a collective. And so we work with two conservancies to enable them to get off the ground to conserve the area together. Um, and this doesn't come easily at all. Um, this requires uh, ultimately meeting the opportunity costs that landowners can get from that land. And ultimately, their landowners leasing the land for conservation purposes, as opposed to leasing the land for agricultural purposes, which would be in direct conflict with the biodiversity in that area. Next slide, please. So as we move towards doing this, we estimate that we have a two year window, if not three year window to really succeed or fail at this. And really what's hanging in the balance is the survival of these last giant ground pangolin. If we succeed and we save the forest and restore the forest, the giant ground pangolin will remain and will thrive in this area. But if we fail, then ultimately it will be the loss of this species from this area, if not from Kenya in, in, in its totality. Next slide, please. 
So the really the last kind of ending to this and the kind of take home message is if we can save the forest, we can save the last of these giant ground pangolin. And our work is only possible through the support of donors such as PCF and and well um, and WCN and individuals like yourselves that really care about nature and biodiversity as much as our team do. So thank you so much for having us and for listening um, and looking forward to, to, to hearing from you. Wow, thank you so much, Claire. It is so inspiring to hear about the work of the Pangolin Project and everything that you're doing to save this incredible species in Kenya. So now you're gonna hear about how the PCF brings different partners together with highly specialized skills so that they can work together and solve these complicated problems together. And so now I'm going to hand you over to Matt and Rory from Langland Conservation, and they are gonna tell you exactly how they've been working alongside Claire. Hi, good evening from uh, from the UK. Thanks very much for having us. It's great to be here. Thank you, WCN and um, and as a particularly um, slide, please. Um, hi, yes. Yeah, so so Langland Conservation is a UK based charity. Uh, well, team are based in the UK, in South Africa, in India, and then the US. Um, and as I said, Rory and I are dialing in from uh, from the UK this evening. Um, slide, please. So what do we do? We provide intelligence support to conservation projects. Uh, we operate across the world from South, Afri uh, South America, all over Africa, in India, and across Southeast Asia. Um, and we provide support in three broad ways. Slide, please. So we support decision makers with intelligence analysis. We collect and we analyze the huge amounts of information on all sorts of factors that exist in and around the areas that we work with. And we use that data then to help park managers and communities to make informed decisions. This can be helping anti-poaching units to be in the right place at the right time to prevent poaching, assisting strategic long-term planning, identifying areas suitable for habitation for various species. And of course, we don't just support pangolins and also to understanding criminal conflict threats to conservation and much more. We train intelligence teams at the front line to collect and analyze data more effectively Ultimately, we want to reduce the reliance on them, on NGOs um, like ourselves. Um, and we support investigations into illegal wildlife trafficking, particularly building understanding of the transnational criminal networks involved and providing our partners and law enforcement agencies with intelligence that leads to arrests and seizures. Slide, please. So we work with a range of partners on a range of species, and like I said, across the across the um, across the world, and we work in many different ways. Um, our intelligence support is always bespoke to the individual project that we're supporting. And Rory, who Lang is Langland's chief technology officer, is going to talk through one of the ways that we supported the Pangolin project in Kenya. Rory, hi everyone, and it's a uh... Real pleasure to speak to you today. I'm going to give you a little bit more of a look at the inner workings, so an example of how we're working with the Pangolin Crisis Fund to use data and intelligence to help threaten uh, species and support local projects. So with the conversion of viable habitat to human settlement and agriculture posing the, one of the main threats for giant pangolin in Nikiri Forest, it's a really crucial task to understand the changing landscape and then target conservation operations in the right places. Uh, that means we can anticipate threats and develop strategies to help counter them. But considering the scale of this landscape and the need to continually update our understanding of it to maintain that situational awareness, it's an absolutely monumental task to survey the ground uh, and create mapping or even use aerial imagery to hand draw features over the top. So this is why we've turned to artificial intelligence to help us with this challenge. Uh, slide, please. But before you can apply AI to a conservation problem like that faced by the pangolins in southern Kenya, you need aerial imagery to work with. And that's where our great partners, Connected Conservation and Airbus, come in. So we successfully applied for award, an award that these two organizations ran, the Satellites for Biodiversity Award. Uh, and we received a budget of satellite imagery uh, using some of the best satellites available, Pleiades and EO. That's the exact satellite that took our imagery over the Nyakweri Forest uh, in really high resolution. And while these great organizations provided the imagery, PCF funded our work to conduct extensive research into how this technology could be adapted to support an amazing landscape level project like the Pangolin Project. 
So the first step was a really intense period of research to identify how we might go about this and really consider what geographic features we might want to detect in our imagery uh, that were crucial for our understanding of the environment, either because they're essential for the well-being of pangolins uh, or because they're threats like the spread of agriculture across their landscape. So we decided that we wanted to detect buildings, uh, an indicator of human settlement, forest, which the pangolins rely on for uh, habitat, uh, and uh, agricultural land, or more specifically, the partitions that are dividing that agricultural land. Uh, and on, on the right, you can see the computer that we built to run this system. It looks fancy, but it costs only a few thousand dollars. And that's brilliant because we can build as many of these we, uh, as we need to support more and more uh, local projects and share the lessons uh, on how we're doing this with other conservation organizations who might want to do the same for their project. Once we had the imagery and the tools we needed, the next step was to uh, figure out how to develop an AI algorithm to spot patterns in the imagery data uh, and then draw those forests, uh, those land partitions and those buildings onto a map. So uh, a computer vision algorithm works a little bit like a detective uh, with dozens of tools at its disposal and a little book of patterns to look for in order to identify what you've told it to. So in our case, we used a, a very capable detective uh, with some great tools made by very clever people at Microsoft Research Asia, uh, who made that model available for free. And then we set about training that detective to solve the questions that we wanted to ask it. That involves giving it enough examples so it can write that book of patterns itself. And then it uses all those different tools to try and spot them in the information that you provide it. And it does that at lightning speeds, thousands of times faster than a human analyst would be able to do. And that's exactly what we did in Yukari Forest, uh, labeling over a thousand kilometers of landscape, a thousand kilometers square of landscape, uh, or around 400 miles square in under 24 hours. That's a task that would have taken a person almost a year if they worked 24 hours a day with no sleep every day of the week. Um, so using AI imagery, uh, AI analysis of imagery, it's not really a new technique within conservation, but however, where our approach differs, is that where it's been done before that's involved using huge technical resources to solve some of the biggest problems facing the planet. But we found a way to make this achievable for local projects with highly specific needs and do that on a shoestring in a tight time frame. Uh, and the best thing is that now we're confident in our process, we can repeat this uh, as many times as we need on new imagery. Uh, and here are the results. Uh, next slide, please. So you can see that the land partitions, they're labeled in orange, the green's been drawn over the trees and uh, the black's been drawn over the buildings. And we've done this uh, for, uh, as I said, a thousand kilometers squared of imagery. Um, and we've tasked uh, Airbus to take a new shot of the Pangolin, pro uh, the Pangolin Project's priority conservation area. So that's gonna make sure that, that the team understand, help un it will help them understand the changes that have happened over the last year. And they'll be working with the most up-to-date analysis possible for the year ahead. Uh, so what that means is where they're looking to protect forest resources, they've got an accurate current map of every square meter of tree cover. Where they're looking to de-electrify fences, where we know where connectivity might be most vital uh, for the pangolins between those areas of forest. Uh, and when they're areas of encroaching farmland and human settlement into the habitat, we can spot those threats and do something about them before they get out of control. So we really appreciate the opportunity that WCN and PCF have given us to support an amazing organization like the Pangolin Project. Uh, and we're really excited about the fantastic relationships we've developed across sector boundaries uh, and the process we've developed uh, for the future. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll just briefly hand back to Matt. Great. Thank you, Rory. Uh, slide, please. OK, so we're able to provide the support that we do through partnerships. So we, with ASA and with the PCF, have built a model which sees us receiving a grant from the PCF that enables us to provide high level intelligence support to dozens of projects across the world at no cost, crucially, to those individual partners. We've also managed to negotiate access to some amazing technology, which means that we can provide support that is way beyond the technical means and the affordability of any of the individual projects that we work with. Slide, please. So I'll hand back to Zoe, but just before I do, I want to say thanks from Langland to our partners and specifically to the Pangolin Project here who do the work that they do at the front end. And particularly thanks to the guy whose job it is to test the electric fences. Um, thanks to the PCF and the WCN for the support to help us to build this capability. And finally, thanks to you, the donors and the supporters, without whom none of us, none of us could do any of this work. Thanks very much, Zoe. 
Awesome. Thank you to our lovely speakers. And now we get to hear from what you all would like to hear more about through the questions that you submitted through the Q&A feature. And if you didn't get to it, feel free to pop your question in just now. And we are going to start with the youngest PCF fan who's on the call right now, or at least that I know of, Rowan, who is Nick's son. He's 11 and he would like to know what is being done to reduce the demand for pangolins because isn't that the root of the problem? Should I take this one? Yes. Thank you so much for your question, right? So, so you're absolutely right. It's fundamental. If we want to tackle this problem for the long term, we have to tackle demand. But to do that, we have to work with the people who are consuming pangolins. So that is people who are eating them and particularly people who are using the scales for, for medicines. And that's why we work with, um, because the biggest threat of all to, to pangolins, the, the big driver is the traditional Chinese medicine market. And so that's why we're working with high level leaders who are themselves passionate about, um, about protecting endangered species. Uh, and, and we work with them and we work with other groups who um, fund and research alternatives. So um, traditional Chinese medicine, herbal alternatives, uh, and, and we work very, very closely with them. So there is a lot of work ongoing to really um, tackle demand at a really high level, because we recognize, just like you have, you're absolutely right. That is the, the, the essential thing. We need to protect the pangolins on the ground in the meantime, but overwhelmingly, we have to tackle demand because only when the demand stops will the pangolins really be safe. Thanks, Aza. Claire, Jennifer would like to know if the giant um, giant pangolin, if the population is genetically viable for their survival. Yeah, it's a really, really great question. Um, and the answer is that that we hope so, right? And that, um, that really we're kind of fighting to save the very last of them in this area. And there's really no reason to think that they can't be a breeding population once the area is secured and, and, and allows them the space to do just that. Um, so if we look at other species, um, what we've seen is that our populations are able to rebound for much smaller numbers than 30 individuals. Um, and so, yes, there's every reason to think that yes that they are still genetically viable and that they will be able to rebound given that if they are in an area that is safe and enables them to do so thank you this one is for rory or matt how much more can we use ai in conservation and what are the possibilities so i'll tackle that one so i think there's absolutely huge room for growth in this space across conservation and that's one as the technology develops uh, and it's becoming more and more accessible. And I think over the last few years, we've really seen it fall uh, from the hands of te uh, technology leaders and big business and, and into the hands of everybody. Um, and uh, as well as the technology moving forward, it's the, the knowledge trickling into the community of how to use it for, for conservation use. And um, analyzing satellite imagery, that's just one use case. There's absolutely loads of them. So for example, uh, as well as having that top-down bird's eye view, uh, you can put this technology inside camera traps. Um, so instead of a human analyst looking through hours and hours of uh, video for, for uh, maybe one very elusive pangolin sighting, uh, we can train a computer to do all of that work, which means we can have more camera traps out in the field, more coverage and more understanding. And it's not just imagery either. I mean, really clever people, not Langland Conservation, they're using AI to understand DNA. Um, so for example, taking swabs from the field and using AI to unpick the secrets of what might be contained in that. Uh, and we might learn things that we, uh, we didn't even know there was a scope to understand about our environment, which is really exciting. That is exciting. Um, Tony would like to know if there's any sort of replanting of trees happening in Nyakweri because um, they know that in the areas where gorillas live, there's been a lot of um, gorilla trees being cultivated and planted. Is this an option for Nyekweri? Yeah, it's a really great question. Thank you. Um, so this first stage is really to secure the area um, and through and and ultimately to have a functioning conservation area um, that we highlighted in the yellow before. Once it is in a conservation state and is secured, is then the opportunity to restore and to reforest. Um, so that's stage two that we hope can move ahead um, in the next 12 to 18 months. Awesome. 
Aza, this one is for you and anyone who can add to that. Caleb says that they are currently majoring in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation sciences. And you had mentioned that you're working with Chinese medicine leaders to end the usage of pangolins and other endangered species in traditional medicine. They speak Mandarin, Chinese as a second language, and they wanted to know, is there anything that they can do to help, be it volunteering, being an intern, or some action that they can do as an individual to in this area of pangolin conservation? Well, it's great to hear from you, Caleb. So thanks so much for um, for writing in. And yeah, absolutely. Um, probably your language skills are the most in demand language skills of all. So um, what would be really great is for you to uh, contact contact us um, and we can chat and we can talk to some of our partners and see if um, if if we can introduce you to them and, and see if it's the sort of thing that that, um, that you might be able to work with them on as an intern or, or let's see what the possibilities are. But uh, the short answer is I, I expect so. So yeah, please do um, please do contact someone with your with your email address or stick it in the chat. Awesome. So this one is going to be for Jeremiah to start, but then I would like you to Claire jump in, Matt jump in. What gives you personally hope for pangolin conservation? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you everyone uh, for giving me this opportunity and uh, welcome so much. Uh, the, the only thing that gives me hope uh, that the remaining pangolin will last or will survive, if I may use that word, uh, if the deforestation stops as far now, because uh, if if habitat protection will not be uh, in front, then and uh, in two years or even in one year there will be no pangolins because uh, people uh, are really doing charcoal burning, they are really deforestating, and uh, their intention is actually to you know to plant crops to sustain their families. And uh, if now we act up at this moment, actually uh, the, the pangolins will actually have somewhere to stay or the, the habitat uh, for Nyakweri will be restored. So the, the only hope we have is to really work on habitat protection and also do more on that because if we, you know, we rely on other things and uh, live along habitat protection, actually we will not be able to have uh, pangolins anymore it will be like a history to some people but if you now do habitat protection i think that is the most and the best thing we can do to you know to save the remaining pangolins in the query ecosystem thank you i'd like to um follow up on that if i may so uh what gives me hope is the people on this call so the incredible pangolin project team langland conservation blow my mind the amazing work that they can do and all of you who are watching this and you care about pangolins as a collective that is what gives me hope i have been on the ground with the pangolin project and i have seen the work that they're doing people like claire people like jeremiah working with local communities explaining to people why this matters so much it is simply astounding how much progress the pangolin project team have made in the last few months alone like it, it it really really is incredible that they are working so fast to save this species and that they have done so much so many um miles of fencing have already been removed from electric fencing it's difficult to to work it's complicated environment to work with people um when your priorities and their priorities don't necessarily seem to be the same to start with and yet the incredible work that this team is doing is bringing people together. Um, and having seen it firsthand, I have to say, that gives me huge hope. Awesome. Matt, quickly. <laughs> yeah, I would just echo, as a, it's collaborations. That's that's what that's what gives us hope on pangolins and every other species. So where you've got incredible teams who are dedicating the skills that they've got in wherever they are, and that includes the people who are jumping on this call and, and donating and supporting that's that's what gives us hope for pangolins and all species collaborations. Okay. Thank you so much. Two quick bio questions for the bio majors on the call. One is how are pangolins defending themselves from predators? What unique adaptations do they have for this purpose? And then the other one was what are you what milk? What kind of milk are you using to feed the baby pangolins that have been rescued from um, trade? 
I'm going to take the milk question. Uh, I'm going to hand over the uh, the pangy question to um, to maybe Jeremiah or Claire. So um, yes, you're right. I think I think that was Mark's question, um, and you asked if it was kitten milk. So so yes, the basis is often kitten formula, but it has a lot of other things added to it. And one of our incredible partners are the Tiki Highwood Foundation. They've been working with pangolins for nearly thirty years, so they really are blazing a trail in terms of how do you keep these really unique animals. Um, how do you help them survive their ordeal? How do you rehabilitate them? They are really, really difficult animals to keep alive in captivity, uh, as Claire has mentioned in the chat. So when you have these really compromised animals, especially the babies, it's difficult. And that's why it's so important to work as a collective because the work of the Tiki Highwood Foundation have had incredible successes through their milk formula, through the other things that they add into that, and so many other things that are quite... Um, unique to pangolins. Um, for example, a pangolin needs to walk to a termite mound. You can't just put it on a termite mound and think that it's going to feed. It has to walk up to it because we think that that is what gets like the, the stickiness of its tongue activated so that it can lap up the food. So there's so many things that we've learned through our partners who've been doing this um, for, for a really long time and we help them share that knowledge. So uh, that was my answer to the milk question. I'm going to hand over to maybe Jeremiah on uh, how do pangolins defend themselves? Okay, thank you so much uh, for that question. Uh, the main uh, or the the way pangolins defend themselves in case of uh, predators or or those uh, animals that uh, feed on actual or kill uh, pangolins, uh, the main main thing they do they don't run, they don't do anything, but they curl into a ball. This is because. Uh, that's the main thing they can do to protect them, themselves because they won't run faster, uh, they are fearless. So the main thing they do, they curl into a ball uh, because the, the, on the stomach side, uh, they, they are free from scales and uh, there are no scales. But uh, when now predators come, actually, when they try to harm them, it's very hard because uh, on the back of the pangolins, there are a lot of scales and it is very hard to harm. Uh, but the, the good thing when they, you know, when they roll into a ball, it is very hard to, you know, to release them or to do anything else to, or to harm it. So that is the main thing they do to, to prevent them or to, you know, to keep them away from predators. Because in the stomach or in the other part of the belly, there are no scales. So if the if an animal or a predator uh, you know intrude into that side of the stomach or any anywhere else uh, in the belly they will actually kill. But when a pangolin curls into a ball, it will be very hard to you know to harm it, and the predator will actually have no way to kill that pangolin. Thank you. Awesome. Um, this question we will follow up with Fosab who wanted to know. They said awesome presentation and the footage The footage is amazing, but they want to know if there's any recent publications on the volume of pangolin scales in the trade post COVID and the China ban. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna ask that Megan follows up with that. We'll, we'll send you the answer, FOSAP. What I did want to um, end on is, as you guys heard, we need to secure the land so that we can protect pangolins. And we also need to buy milk and other things, which costs money. So Claire, what do you need money for? And I don't really have a lot right now. I have maybe $5. What can you do with that? And what are you, like, what kind of donations are you looking for? What can you do with them? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, that's, uh, yeah, it's always a, a thing, isn't it? That they kind of ask, what, what can people do? And that's the amazing thing about webinars such as this is bringing people that, that really want to help together. And the answer is that uh, anything anyone can do is, is really amazing, whether that's volunteering time, whether that's spreading awareness. So someone in the chat there mentioned about being on safari and people not knowing about Pangolin. So spreading that word is really, really critical. And obviously, if you do want to donate um, to organizations, then then really the, there is no um, minimum amount and um, everything helps and contributes um, toward, towards pangolins. 
Um, Ten dollars really very much helps us to and um, uh, to to really um, uh, support our team on a community awareness front, and that means them getting out and going to households and going into schools to talk about pangolin and about forests and about conservation of this, these areas. Um, it also what it enables us to do is to kick off um, uh, the growth of saplings to reforest areas. Then if looking kind of on a bit more, $100 uh, enables us to, to in, 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 in essence, protect an acre of land per year. Um, and, and then the camera traps are $250 and they lead into to monitoring aspects as well. But no amount is too little. Um, it comes from having many, many people contributing in any way that they can, from awareness through to volunteering time through any donation size at all. Thank you. Azza, how about you? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So, um, yeah, I would just echo that. There is no amount too small. There is no amount too large. So um, fuel, for example, like $10 helps with vehicle fuel. $50,000 helps with a vehicle. And there's everything in between. So, um, like Claire said, camera traps, uh, $250. Uh, tagging a pangolin, just over $1,000. Um, milk formula, $50. We'd, we'd, buy, we'd buy milk formula for, for quite a lot of baby pangolins. So... Um, there's a whole range of things and, and whatever anyone is able to contribute will be gratefully received. So yeah, um, no amount too small, no amount too large. Well, you heard it here, folks. And I am sure Megan has put in the chat the donation link. Um, Julia Ward actually had a really great question. She asked, do you have something to send us for those who would like to leave a legacy gift? And I know the answer to that. And I hope Megan is popping in the chat the link to WCN's amazing plant giving um, program where you can leave a lasting legacy to wildlife should you choose to. And we hope you do. And folks, that is the end of the show. Thank you so much for joining us on your Friday. And I hope these stories of hope have created as great a start to your weekend as they did to mine. There's a lot to be done, but as you can tell, everyone is hopeful. We're all excited. We can do more. Um, few last announcements. I wanted to remind you, uh, the next Closer Look is on Friday, uh, March 15th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, where we will be talking to Marisset, learning about their bycatch mitigation work to protect dolphins. The link should be in the chat for you to register. If we didn't get to your question, follow up with Megan. Her email address should be in the chat as well. She's awesome. She'll get you the right answer. Also, save the date if you are in San Francisco or want to be in San Francisco. Uh, we have our Spring Expo happening on April 20th in the South Bay. We would love to see you there. So either we'll see you on the internet on March 15th or in person uh, for the Spring Expo in April. And also, happy Pangolin Day. Thank you all so, so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.